with Bert Nett, and she's based in San Carlos de Bariloche in Argentina. And she's going to be talking about a, an, a Latin American plea for incorporation of other non-English languages in Tadwick standards. Take it away. Paula, uh, I don't hear you, you're muted. There we go, thank you. Thanks Gail, and thanks everyone for, for coming to this session. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about English and standards and how the rest of the non-English speaking community have troubles with that. So to start, uh, let me, let me ask you how many native English speakers do you think there are in the world? And the answer is English is the third um, most natively speak, spoken language, but that only accounts for less than 5% of the total world population. So, well, okay, uh, probably there are much more people that actually speak English. And yeah, that is true. English is the most spoken language worldwide. However, that still only accounts for less than 17% of the population. So what about languages and English in almighty science? Well, there are a lot of studies out there, both from the natural sciences and from the social sciences that explore this issue of English having become the de facto language uh, for science. So I'm not going to go into details, but as an example, um, there was a study that looked into scientific documents that were uh, that could be searched for in, in Google Scholar in different in different languages, and they found, using as um, keywords biodiversity and conservation, that 35.6 percent of these scientific documents were not in English, were in other languages, and moreover, half of them had a title or an abstract in English, but the other half did not have anything in English, were completely in other, in other languages. So this means that there is a lot of knowledge that A, cannot be found because it's not indexed, and B, cannot be understood because we cannot really understand a whole baggage of knowledge from, from an abstract. So we're definitely missing something and not just from uh, for, for the non-English speaking community, but for the English speaking community as well. There's a lot of knowledge at local, regional, indigenous level that is not actually being used for uh, decision making. So a little closer to us going to biodiversity data, if we look into GBIF as our point of reference, we find that half uh, of the records that are shared through GBIF come from uh, publishing countries that have English as their official language. Uh, then 40% uh, of the of the records come from countries that are not uh, English speakers. And even more, if we look at the actual number of publishers, um, the number of countries that, that, that publish um, and have no in, uh, sorry, have other languages as, as their native languages or the majority. So this is a thing also for biodiversity data. And how does this relate with data standards? Well, we know that data publication is not this straight and easy line that I'm showing here, but it's rather a convoluted path that needs that data providers understand the data standards so that they can share their, their data. And so to better uh, grasp uh, our needs in the Spanish speaking community, we put out a survey uh, asking for the relationship between English and the use of the data standards in our uh, community. So we included two sections. One was a common section for everyone. There was about the use of English that included questions like, which is your level of English and is English a problem for you when you use um, data standards? And then we had another section for uh, project coordinators so that we can get their insights about uh, how our providers. So we distributed this survey through uh, email and, and social media and I'm going to show you 
the results of this uh, of this survey right now. So we had over 200 participants, most from Ibero-America, but we also had some uh, some that contributed from other countries. We were very thankful for that. And the roles of the people participating were were various, from digitization to coordination, data use, and publication, and help desk, and most of the people declare that their level of English was either intermediate or advanced. However, when they were asked if English was a barrier to the use of uh, biodiversity data standards, almost 80% said that yes, English is a problem for us. Furthermore, when we asked um, the coordinators, uh, the majority of them estimated that between 50 and 80% of their providers have problems with English when using biodiversity data standards. And, and other questions that we asked were related to uh, how people deal with English when they are going, attending conferences or capacity enhancement events that are related to standards as well. And so we asked about attending those events and half of the people said that they attend but they have difficulties with language and regarding presentation, this was striking. 40% of the people said, I do not present my results in other language that is not my own. I, I don't present in English. And there was also 37% that says, well, yeah, I present my results, but I have trouble with, with the language. And then the last question was about communication with peers. And we found again that the vast majority of the people are having trouble communicating because Communication is in English in general in this in these events. So other other interesting results that we got were for the free comments in this survey, and some of those were evidently the standards will be more used uh, in our communities if they were in Spanish. Others said that the barriers uh, make it very difficult for areas that are mega diverse to share their data because the people living in those areas don't know the language and don't understand the standards to share their data. And others said that the problems that arise in understanding the standards end up affecting the data quality of the data. And also, very important, it was mentioned several times that including other languages is a way of respecting the diversity in our community. So. If you want to see more results, I invite you to go into that link uh, on the screen and you can see the whole the whole survey and, and what people answer. But together with this, we put out a petition for the incorporation of other languages into Tadwick documentation and standards. And this petition was signed by uh, 198 of the people who completed the survey, plus of those, more than a hundred people said they were willing to contribute translations into Spanish. So the plan is to present this to the executive committee of Tabo and we hope we can give it some consideration. Now, we would like to say that we acknowledge that there, we need a strategy to, to move this forward. And so one, one place that we can look up to is the GBIF translators model. Uh, GBIF has a vast, um, a, a very, big community of translation of translators uh, that are volunteers and they have a coordinator team uh, ruling their activity and they also have the, the, the technical aspects of uh, having a platform available and a forum and a backend infrastructure that allows the incorporation of those multilingual materials. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Chadwick circumstances are uh, a little different uh, the, our community is smaller, effectively, and we have a limited capacity in personnel. And we also have some technical aspects that we must consider, like currently the web page does not allow easy incorporation of multilingual materials. And someone stopped my sharing, could it be? Can you still hear me? We can still hear you. Um... Uh, okay. says something about loading. Will... Uh, and it's no, it's just back to the beginning. For me. Okay, but it's it's going through your slides again. Can you see it there? 
Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, sorry. I don't know what happened there. So, um, back to the technical, the technical things is uh, standards require uh, expert knowledge to be translated. So, there are a series of elements that we must consider. And one is that what we were talking before, there are two, two types of things that we could translate is web content and other documents and standards. And so we should evaluate the structure of the web page and understand if it, that would have a cost. We should provide guidelines for translations of standards and maybe understand who could contribute to that. Maybe uh, have the int maintenance interest groups involved in, in this kind of, um, of activities. Also, we need to, of course, identify the volunteers and we have identified the volunteers for Spanish at least. And we have to define a platform where to do it that has to grant global access. It should work not only for Spanish, but also for other languages. And we should prioritize content and standards to be translated so that we can speed up the process. And also super important we think is that we should establish a coordinator role within Tadway. And for that, we would hope that Tadway would commit to advance in this front and we understand that to do that, we would need a couple of sentences that express a clear vision of the advantages of going multilingual. So this is a call to all the community, not just the Spanish speaking one, to work together so that we can find the best strategies to make biodiversity data standards more inclusive so that we can all benefit uh, from that. I invite you to go to uh, this document link here. It's a strategies document. This one is in English, don't worry. And in there we have captured some of the things that I mentioned. I invite you to please comment, add your expertise and, and your opinion to that to that document. And with this, I'm, I'm finishing. I thank you very much for your attention. I would like to also to thank especially the my, my co-authors and also uh, the GBIF Spain uh, team our colleagues who are not authors in this presentation, but have done a great job of supporting this initiative. So thank you very much. Uh, Gail, you're muted. Thank you, sorry. Um, Thank you very much, Paula. Uh, we have some questions first from Dmitry Shegel. Uh, from a Russian here, I learned that we need to balance English as a uh, universal language of science. Um, will the local needs be to bring up uh, local capacity using uh, local languages? Um, I think I missed something in that sentence. I'm obliged to highlight the efforts of uh, GBIF's Russian community speaking later today um, to contribute to this mission. Local languages are likely the key to enter local communities. A lesson for Tadwick to learn. Thanks, Paula. Um, would you like to add anything to that? Or shall I go on to the uh, next? Thanks, thanks Dimitri first. And yeah, I know I know of the efforts of the Russian community. They are, they are, they are great. They, they done uh, such 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 an effort and yeah I think I think to reach the locals you have to talk with the locals uh, it's difficult from Tadwig uh, and it's probably different from GBIF in the sense that uh, for Tadwig what we're looking for is to translate more specific uh, content like standards cannot be translated without being super careful because we don't want errors to propagate and we're, we will be translating definitions and stuff. So yeah, local, but we need the global community, I think, to, to check it out and to be involved. So Walter Adink um, says developing a course uh, in, let's see, course English for biodiversity data users might be the cheapest and m most robust solution. Um, um, and a course for acronyms for more advanced users. Uh, Dimitri says plus one. Um, 
from a robust and well uh, English route, we can proliferate um, to English, Russian, et cetera, uh, secondary materials and reach out uh, to not so English parts of the world. Um, and Ko Koivanen, excuse me, uh, of course, in, for acronyms would be nice. Annie Simpson says that acronyms don't really need a course. They need someone to create and maintain a lookup table on the web. Any volunteers? Um, so there's, there's an well, active piece of this. I was just going to say there's a lot of support for that in the chat. <laughs> OK. Uh, would anybody like to talk to this? Let's see, this is. Um, I would like to ask if, if I if I have a moment, can mm -hmm. I? Yes. Yeah. I would yes. like to ask the the English speaking people in in the room, uh, like how did you feel seeing that the presentation was in Spanish? But I mean, I, I know that there are plenty of Spanish speakers in the room, but I'm interested in knowing like what, what's your what's your perception with that? Because that's our normal daily situation that we have things in a language that is not ours. But I would like to get your feedback on that if you don't have any other more relevant questions. <laughs> I think you can unmute yourself if you ha would like to um, ask or um, there are people who are uh, Talking in the chat um, from I loved it. Um, and I know for me, it was fun to, to also see the, the Spanish and hear the English, but I also know some Spanish. And so that made it just more fun. I'd like to Can add. Yeah, myself, Rajeshree, I'm from India. I would like to say that if, if it is a scientific presentation, then graphs, pie chart, and those things are quite okay. Because anybody can understand those things when you are describing those things with numbers and these issues. Only thing is that when you are explaining, like you are making some statements or something like that in your own language, if it, this language has some similarity with English words, little bit easier for English speaking people because sometimes they can communicate. Like, okay, yeah, it looks like a very familiar word in English. So it might be like that. That way, sometimes we can communicate. But obviously, if it is a very hardcore Spanish or other kind of non-English languages, then it might be a little bit difficult. But uh, if the slide is quite uh, well decorated with all those explanatory graphs and other features, then I don't think it's too tough for us to understand. That is my opinion. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to know, Rob, are you queued up? We still have room for one more question, but um, I just want to make sure that you're queued, uh, queued up for uh, starting in a couple minutes. Yeah, I think Dimitri has his hand up. Uh, ah, okay, Dimitri. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, so I'm, enjoying this talk very much. And I see it with a kind of double set of eyes. I see it as a, somebody who worked in English for the last 20 years. And I see it as a native Russian speaker. So um, I actually have to make a confession here. Um, in my time in GBIF, I thought that, OK, English is the kind of universal language of science. Whoever is in science is obliged to speak English and understand all these Darwin core uh, terminology and so on. But then the more I worked with the Russian speakers in the former Soviet Union space, the more I realized that the value of the local language as the kind of super penetrating tool to get to the deepest kind of uh, to, to the heart of the community of the locals. So switching to the local language is the absolute unbeatable power and we cannot ignore it in Tadwick. 
if Denmark is okay to stay in this kind of white Anglo-Saxon European Union plus America corner, that's fine. Stick to that and you'll be kind of staying in that part of the world. If you want to reach out to Asia, to Russia, to Africa, to Latin America, to Oceania, there is something that should happen with language policy. And uh, I mean, it is from, from our experience in, in Jibiv, it's very important to have the English story, the core story right. Then you can produce uh, language specific materials and reach out to the communities that you wouldn't reach otherwise. Thank you very much, Paula. This was a really, really good talk. Well, thank you very much. I, I think there are lots more conversations that need to go on around this as well. Uh, Rob, you are up.